Hello, everybody. My name is Jacek Bartosiak. Welcome to Strategy in Future. And today, uh, my guest is uh, Brandon Weikert, uh, the author of the great book that I recently read and I reviewed at Strategy in Future, titled Winning Space. Hello, Brandon. Hello. How are you? Okay. I promise uh, to my guests that I will start out directly with the book, uh, which is fascinating. And this book is an uh, epitome of the new era that is coming yeah. upon us. And this is yeah. what is in the book. I fully agree. And uh, those who follow uh, me and Strategy in Future know that we uh, actually discuss it in detail that this is all coming upon us, whether we like oh, it yeah. or not. And whether we deal with that uh, just exactly in line with how Brandon is, has structured in the book offensively, uh, without uh, looking back, uh, without constraints, uh, to, to grab it as it is. Uh, why did you write this book? What was the motivation of the book? Well, I had started, uh, what, about six or seven years ago, I started a job on Capitol Hill, and I was working for one of the members of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And uh, my first day on the job, my boss said, uh, after the orientation and everything, he said, all right, now, I want you to go down to this meeting later today um, and you know, write write something on it. And I said, well, what's it on? He goes, I don't know. It's something to do with space. I said, I said, okay. okay. So I, I went down and it was um, one of the, the less, uh, one of the less opulent meeting rooms in the basement. And that sort of gave me the indication that, uh oh, this is not that important to most people. I went in and it was a bunch of retired Air Force and NASA people. And uh, they were organized and they were trying to basically advocate for a greater degree of investment and interest on the part of Congress into space. And one of the hooks they used in the briefing uh, was how vulnerable uh, our satellites were. And, you know, me, I, I was always interested in geopolitics. I studied political science and international relations as an undergraduate. And I, you know, obviously grew up in the, the sort of the Iraq war year. So, you know, war and politics were sort of in my it, 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 I was aware of them. But after listening to the briefing and seeing how little interest either party were in talking about this and in terms of the political parties, I wrote a report and my boss didn't want to read it. And he said, ah, well, you know, this is too expensive what they're talking about. We, we've got to focus on, on more important things, more terrestrial things. And so I felt like, you know, I had felt like kind of we caught the carriers steaming toward Pearl Harbor in a, in a way, and nobody really cared. And so I ended up uh, continuing working, and I ended up going into academia afterward, and I, I got a master's degree. I spent some time at Oxford, uh, and then I was working on my doctoral studies. I ended up not doing a doctorate, but I always kept working on space policy that sort of became my milieu. That was, that was my, that was what I was working on. And um, I ended up giving a lecture series in Washington, DC, members of the Trump administration or the Trump campaign had come in, they had heard about me and they were, um, you know, kind of lifting things from my, my briefings on space dominance. And three days after I gave one of the particular lectures in DC that was off the record, three days later, the, the president or candidate Trump at the time is using space dominance for the first time. This was three days after my lecture, which I was told members of his campaign, his, his advisory committee were in the audience. And so I was flattered. Um, of course, I was like, it's too bad. I don't get any credit for this. So, you know, I decided that this needs to reach a, reach a wider audience still. And I sat down and started writing the book, uh, went through several drafts and finally settled on this version and um, pitched it and finally got it out. To me, this is, this is the most, one of the most important issues our country faces, the world really faces. And um, even today, even though we now have a space force and we are moving positively in a, in a good direction, it's still slow starts. I brief the Pentagon regularly, and the, a lot of the people involved with space don't really know what to do with it, or there's sort of this bureaucratic antipathy 
uh, to the idea from the Air Force of another branch that might cleave money and power away from the Air Force. And it's it's so it's a it's a one step forward, two step back kind of thing. And I wrote this book sort of as to try to bring everybody together and to try to get public attention on it so that there is a lot of pressure to move forward and not go back. Yeah, I, I found it, of course, very interesting and uh, in, a, in a way promoting the, uh, the interest in space as a uh, military domain and also right. as a domain where the new connectivity, new economy will be, yes. uh, will, will be there, which in, you know, in return will also reinforce the need for the militarization of yep. the space. And let's not be shy about it. Let's just, let's just do it. Yeah. Uh, right. Let's right. be first before the uh, the Chinese will get there first right. and establish the full spectrum dominance. That's so right. um, I I found it very interesting that uh, you don't stop shy of uh, of just saying that we don't need the deterrence by denial. We don't need the posture which is a lukewarm posture. We the U.S. we need a full spectrum dominance in space yeah. without any uh, doubt. Uh, so that yeah. we could control the Earth Moon system uh, and, of course, the, the, the orbits of the Earth that are yeah. over, I mean, superimposing, imposing yes. on the on the Terra, on the on yes. the military domains, air, land, and sea, in the coming conflicts. Right. How? What was the What is the reaction? In the U.S., tell me. I mean, when you, when, um, you, when you talk to the audience and the officers. Well, the reason, the reason I went that route is because I was, that was, you know, I was fed up with uh, going to these briefings that I was giving and everyone sort of, like you said, kind of going around and dancing around. What we all, I think, deep down instinctively want to see happen, which is America dominate space because it's, I think it's for the best. Um, I don't want to live in a Chinese dominated, you know, world. And, and if they dominate space, that's what will happen. And so I was just fed up with, of dancing around the issue and sort of writing in that academic speak of having said that on the, I just, you know, I said, let's clarify this. Cause that's what this needs to be. It's just a, this is a warning uh, to, you know, the people of, of America that, that we're going to get hit if we don't take a more proactive stance and we've got to move fast because we've let so much time lapse from when we really were the undisputed hegemon in space to today, which is a lot of people, including some allied countries, are questioning whether we really are this dominant space power. And so for me, I, I just needed to cut through sort of the jargon and just say what, what I think everybody's really thinking. And the reaction has been... Um, quite visceral. I give briefings to the DOD, um, but there are a group of people who don't want to hear it. And it's, it's, um, it's kind of worrying to me because a lot of these people I'm briefing are three and four star generals. And I don't know if they're just being politically correct or if they really mean it, but a lot of them are much more toward the idea of maybe at most doing a deterrent based model. But as you know, as I say in the book, the threats to us are greater in space from China, like with their counter space weapons, uh, than what we can threaten China with right now, because they're not as dependent on space technologies as we are. In another decade, they'll start being more dependent. Uh, but for now, the Chinese have a critical advantage on us that they can exploit and deny us access to those sensitive systems. And so I'm tired of, of really dancing around this. And, and it's time that we not only defend our satellites, and deter the enemy, but we need to go full bore now. And we need to actually take space because China speaks quite explicitly about this. I mean, I know you, I deal, I do, I deal with the Chinese. I hear what they say among themselves. I know sort of the, the thought patterns of what's going on. Um, I saw your, your interview, the great interview you just did with Everett Dolman, and he made the point, the same point, you know, the Chinese are traditional geopolitical thinkers in 2018. Yi Pijian, the head of China's lunar space program, he told openly the press, the international press, he said, we Chinese view, view the universe as an ocean and the moon as the South China Sea. Now, me being a geopolitical guy, my alarm bells start going off sure. when I hear that. And so at that point, I figured, you know, we've really got to, I've got to really get this book out and it has to be very clear. 
And whatever pushback I receive, and I've received a lot from sort of the academic side of things, um, but that's okay because I think that creates a great conversation. And furthermore, um, I think it forces people who try to hide their, their, their true beliefs, which is that they don't want to see America dominate. It forces those people to come out and basically, you know, say that, hey, uh, we don't believe America should dominate space. And, and I, want to, I want to call those people out. Yeah, and you do it in, 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 yeah. in, the, in the book. I remember the, this identification of the group that you called utopian uh, people yeah. and also the people, I don't remember the- The, 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 the naysayers. The, the naysayers, yes, the naysayers. Yeah. So you yeah. identify and uh, suddenly out of the blue, seemingly out of the blue, but right yeah. now it turned out that you also had some, you know, you, you, you gave some add on to it. Uh, out of the blue, Donald Trump announces uh, in December uh, last year, okay, now we have this, uh, the Space Force and we need to be a, a dominant power uh, right. in this new uh, high frontier, you know, the ultimate domain of the battlefield right. and so on. Uh, of course, finally, it will not be ultimate because Trump was uh, referring to the uh, Leos and Mios and right. uh, geostationary. Right. We will talk also later during our conversation about the Earth Moon system and maybe yeah. the. Uh, the solar system itself, because yeah. there is always some ultimate domain somewhere always, there. Always, uh, right. but but it is true that it seems that in the uh, 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 right now emerging revolution military affairs, when the, the center of gravity is a battle network, right. it's a space assets that uh, right. might might be decisive. This is probably why you opened up. You opened the the, the book with a chapter titled uh, 2022. The year yeah. space per harbor happens, yeah. uh, where, you know, it might be very, very swift for uh, for the audience yeah. to know. Uh, and usually in naval warfare, and probably in space, it will be the same. There yeah. is a, a thing called a skating effect. So once yeah. you, you start losing assets, mm -hmm. you really start losing faster. Okay. Yes. And then yes. within a day, the U.S. Uh, power, global power projection capabilities may be completely uh, right. annihilated. Yeah. So if yes. you could expand on that a little bit. Uh, yeah. so that the other and so in the book, the scenario I went with, and this was really because when I wrote that chapter, I had just finished, uh, I played Russia in the Baltic storm exercise that a private company in D.C. had done. Uh, and I opened up my attack on NATO with precisely this space gambit. And uh, it worked. Um, but um, so that was still fresh in my my mind when I went back and, and wrote this chapter, um, because, you know, my editor said, you know, really, it could be China. Every, you know, everybody's talking about China. I said, absolutely. And I think in the, I think at one point in the book, I do make it clear a space Pearl Harbor could be conducted by either Russia or China. But I really thought um, with with everything that's going on right now. Uh, in the scenario, it, it doesn't matter whether it's Russia or China. I just picked Russia because at the time everyone was talking about China and also I, it was still fresh on my mind. But the point remains the same, whether it's Russia or China, um, they have figured out that our power projection capabilities can be easily rolled back if they just knock out those satellites. And so you see right now, uh, Russia for the last couple of years has been seeding the battle, the, not the battleground, but the, uh, the, the, the territory around earth with, um, they used to call them as Tribitel Sputnikov. Uh, they're sort of these co-orbital satellites. Uh, they have little grappling arms. The Russians officially declare that these systems are onboard repair systems for their larger communications, civilian and military satellites. But in reality, we know that these small, uh, uh, what we call space stalkers, can, as the name suggests, trail our sensitive satellites in orbit and when ready, when ordered by, by the, the enemy, can knock out our satellites, physically push them from orbit. And that can happen rather instantaneously. And we don't really have a defense against them. These systems are too small for us to knock out. And they're very difficult for us to track. The Chinese have also started doing the same thing. Um, when they're, uh, they did a test of their space plane last month, and on its way back to Earth, something ejected from it, and it was not debris, and NORAD currently is tracking it. It remains in orbit. I believe it was in one of these space stalkers. And so uh, they're, they're right now, I think, preparing the, the battle space around Earth. And I think uh, the reason I picked 2022 is because we know that the, the, the Chinese and Russians in particular love to exploit American elections. And at the time, I figured, you know, I, I mean, I personally 
I, I have an opinion on the presidential election. I think that we're going to see a re-election of this president. And if that were to happen, I think that the Chinese um, or the Russians are going to be very scared because you know, this president's been very tough on, on, on our enemies. And so they're going to try to exploit another period, I think, of in, internal contention, which would be another election. So I just picked 2022. Um, and at that point, as we're, again, fighting amongst each other in an electoral battle, one of our enemies could decide to use these systems they've been seeding in orbit to knock out our satellites. And then the Russians, if it were the Russians, they could attack uh, Eastern Europe. They could take what they wanted there. Uh, and if it were the Chinese, they could attack uh, Taiwan. In recent days, I wrote a Washington Times piece recently in which I said it looks like China's getting ready to possibly attack Taiwan, and they're going to use the election as, as sort of a, a period of exploitation for them. Uh, I recently briefed the Navy in California about a month ago, and they were talking about this war game that the, the findings have since been released in Proceedings Magazine, in which the sort of the framing of the war game was uh, an, an election in the United States this year is contested by the two candidates, and it's resolved by the Supreme Court. Court, the same timeline uh, of the 2000 re uh, recount took until December for the decision to be made on who was president. So the war game said, well, we'll assume the same conditions and that that's the window that China might decide to launch a surprise attack on Taiwan while we're distracted. So I said, hey, uh, you know, the Chinese might try to do one of these space Pearl Harbors to knock us out while we're fighting amongst each other. And then they have the ability to, to rush into Taiwan. They have all the time they need uh, to do what they want with Taiwan or somewhere in the South China Sea. So the, these are sort of the, the, the um, uh, pressure points that our enemies are looking at. And a space Pearl Harbor would knock out our, our ability to deploy forces, knock out our surveillance capabilities. It would knock out, you know, basically our ability to coordinate mass and resist a, a large scale military attack on an area that we deem to be strategically vital. And um, it would be, I think, probably more devastating than Pearl Harbor was, and certainly more devastating than the 9-11 attacks were. And that, to me, is something we should be all worried about. And I never really hear anyone taking this threat seriously in, in official circles. Yeah, let me support your, your proposition. Uh, back in 2016, I wrote a book about the coming war uh, in mm -hmm. the Western Pacific. It was basically right. about the earth -Sea battle concept and the structural right. structure, structural uh, pressure that, that would be increasing between U.S. That's and China right. in terms of trade. And uh, that uh, there is no way that the U.S. power projection could be debilitated, you know, defeated without attacking or jamming right. or eliminating the space assets. And also right. U.S. was too heavily relying on space. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, if China really wanted to win, even a small scale right. uh, escalation, uh, you know, sometimes things get uh, heat, heated up, you know, by, by, right. by, by accident. So they will need to do it. Uh, otherwise, right. uh, otherwise, it's, so space will be inevitably yes. a, a battlefront domain. Well, and I think it's important to note that um, the, looking at the, I, I studied a lot of strategic warning and surprise is sort of one of my, my bread and butter areas. I studied Roberta Wallstetter's book very closely and I quoted her, you know, frequently in, in this book. Um, the, the, uh, the object of our enemies with these attacks is always the same. It's prevent the Americans from responding in a, in a fast enough manner that way and keep them distracted at home long enough. That way they figure, you know what? It's not worth going to war over Taiwan. It's not worth going to war over Eastern Europe. We'll negotiate a new settlement. It's all about playing to what they think is America's um, uh, very weak political system. And um, th the last couple of times this was tried, it didn't work. My concern is when we really are rendered deaf, dumb, and blind, truly by a space Pearl Harbor, we might not have a choice but to negotiate a new settlement. And that's not a position I think we should ever want to be in. It's quite frightening. And that, that, that brings our conversation into detailed understanding of the uh, military, of the modern battlefield. So mm -hmm. it might be so, theoretically. It's not mature maybe enough, but if you control... The, the, the ultimate domain of the space and you get annihilated there, 
then there is no use actually to fight on Terra anymore because you will lose anyway. <laughs> right. You are right. surrounded in terms of the you know right. new modern scouting battle that you can't see and right. you're blind and your opponent can see you and kill you. Right. Uh, given the, you know the, how technology works on the battlefield now, right. so it might be so that the space dominance might be a really peacemaker in a way. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, this is yes, and this is something that I believe fervently. Um, I think that you know this th that's where it needs to go. Look, we've dominated the seas. America has, and we've had open trade. We've had real prosperity and freedom and and good good stability for the United States at least, um, and many countries that otherwise would have been subject to a more authoritarian power. Um, these countries have been allowed to, to prosper and grow. And, uh, you know, we have vibrant democracies now. Uh, in, you know, places like Poland, places, you know, all you, you pick these countries that otherwise might have been part of a Russian sphere of influence or a Chinese sphere of influence with Taiwan. Um, you know, the, the American dominance has helped to foster this sort of prosperity and freedom. And um, that might all end if we lose space. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very dangerous position that we've put ourselves in. And, and I should say, um, you know, in the book, I spend a lot of time talking about the Pentagon's uh, you know, acquisitions process. Um, one of the reasons is because we have allowed these weaknesses and vulnerabilities to form. Uh, the, the, no enemy could have done this to us. This was the corrupt system, the inefficient system uh, in Washington, D.C. for between the Congress and the Pentagon that allowed for these systems to, to become very vulnerable. We've relied too much on them, and then we've made them very vulnerable. Our enemies are now at a point where they know that, and they have the ability for relatively low cost to them to knock those systems out and just see what happens on Earth. And it will not be pretty, because we do not have a large enough military to sort of resist a, a, a surge of Chinese or Russian forces on us. Our military is small and it is spread out. And th those satellites and our high tech serves, as you know, as a force multiplier. When in a crisis happens, we can mass punch back and then sort of, you know, let the situation settle and then go back to that very spread out condition. That's, that's not going to be possible with the loss of satellites. We will, we will lose categorically. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It's a, it's a very accurate description of uh, what might be the coming future very shortly by the way because we have yeah. strategy in future we are really concerned with the with the developments worldwide what is happening now yeah. with the fragmentation of structure yes. of the world order and poland as i speak i speak yeah. from warsaw it's halfway between beijing and washington dc it's yes. 200 kilometers closer to beijing yeah. than to dc well, and i can walk to Beijing, which is a, yes, a different thing. Yes, this is why yes. this is why the sort of a development of the space power space uh, power projection, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, makes you know, which which creates a situation where the U.S. forces may be everywhere, one hundred kilometers above my head, you know, right. common line, right, and project power, right, you know, in a new way, is a bit reassuring. I mean, I saw it of, is, uh, it is, uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and one of the things that I've been talking with, with our, the U.S. military about that they've been interested in is um, the Defense Innovation Unit has been looking for um, uh, 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 proposals on getting manned space stations uh, for the, the new Space Force in orbit. This was a hearkening back to the old 1960s uh, manned orbital laboratory program that the Air Force ran that was uh, I think wrongly canceled in the late 1960s uh, when, or 1970s when uh, Nixon took power. This was a pet project of LBJ's and the object was to put manned satellites in orbit. Now the unmanned satellites today are probably more efficient technologically and certainly cheaper, but the logic was you establish a human ecosystem in orbit and you put it under the, 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 the military and you've now created an entirely new capability. And so the DIU is looking at rehabilitating that capability now that they have a space force. Uh, the special forces are keenly interested in developing uh, the old SUSTAIN program that, that uh, the Marines had started and then abandoned in the early 2000s, which was uh, the Marines plan to buy one of the 
Richard Branson's uh, uh, Virgin Galactic ships, the space plane, and they wanted to modify it in order to allow for Marine units to be deployed instantaneously around the world. They could launch from the United States and head over to any combat zone uh, through space and drop down, sort of like the orbital drop shot troopers, not yeah. quite from Halo. Yeah. But this is, but this is, you know, now science fiction is becoming science reality, and this opens up a whole new realm of capabilities. We could be placing supplies in orbit and call down for them when units are in, are in a situation where they need immediate and rapid resupply. And there's a there's just a whole lot of things that we could do now that ordinarily we. We could not to sort of overcome the A to A D capabilities of our rivals, and that's a critical component, I think, of space force that's not talked about enough. Yeah, that is true, and probably this is why uh, the Starship project has been uh, analyzed by the uh, uh, strategic lift or transportation uh, department. Yeah, the, yeah. The, yeah, yeah, last yeah. month, yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. So what do you think about the new space? There is a, a chapter uh, for the audience mm -hmm. to know in, in the book uh, describing uh, very nicely and accurately, in my opinion, uh, the new space uh, industry. What is your uh, opinion about that and how it can you know, evolve uh, into the future? Um, my opinion is that this is the this is the the way this is the way forward is is giving America's private sector the ability to develop space. When I worked on Capitol Hill, we passed a law. Uh, I think it was called the, the Launch Act. Basically, in 2014, it allows for any American company that can reach an asteroid and acquire the resources to bring those resources back to Earth and sell them. Uh, this is a huge step toward the, the birth of the space mining industry. The space mining industry, at minimum, is worth a trillion dollars. It's considerably more because we now know right now NASA's observing an asteroid that's worth 700 quadrillion dollars in rare earth minerals and other essential ores. That's more than the entire planetary economy. And so, and it's nearby, we can get there. The Chinese are putting a satellite into orbit uh, next month that will, it's a, it's a probe that they're going to test that can go and robotically mine asteroids. Uh, in the next six months, China will then place a, an, obser an observation satellite in geosynchronous orbit, uh, and it will observe the asteroid belt, and Chinese scientists will identify mineable asteroids and exploit those asteroids with that unmanned probe entitled NEO-1. Uh, the Chinese also are currently on the dark side of the moon, and they plan by the middle of this decade to have an unmanned um, uh, colony on the moon and eventually will man it with their space miners. At the, by the end of the decade, they plan to basically begin strip mining the moon because it's an abundant, uh, it has a, an abundant supply of rare earth minerals. And the Americans, we have identified, we know, we talk about this stuff. We've talked about it, you know, since the late 90s doing these things, but we're just starting to take the first steps. The problems that the space industry faces are ones of regulation, as always, with private sector. And so what I propose in the book is we're going to have to go in and either abrogate the Outer Space Treaty, which makes it very difficult for the private sector to actually mine and harvest space resources, or we need to renegotiate with our partners. And it looks like the President Trump has started doing this with the Artemis Accords. Uh, we yeah. need to renegotiate with our you're, partners. Yeah. You're on this, on this path, I guess. Yeah. Uh, 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 Artemis Accords. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, rumor has it that the new Homestead Act somewhere, you know, uh, this, this time pertaining to Moon, for the corporations yeah. to mine so that there is a money, monetary yes. incentive. And yes, and, and the yeah. problem is the regulation because even when we passed the Launch Act in 2014, we had the congressional lawyers saying, look, this, this or the State Department lawyers rather saying to us, look, um, um, you know, we, 
you can do this, but this could be a violation of international law. And so when you have that sort of confusion, it tends to increase risk to investment. And that That's that right. is what tends to be a problem to get, if you'll pardon the expression, getting off the ground, because investors don't like the high risk if they're going to get punished, uh, you know, at the international level for investing in, in space but, mining. And so. But, but Brandon, once the Starship will, really is in, in the space, it yes. has it will have the refueling capability which yes. is a game changer yes, yes. in orbit yes and, and once yes. you have the gateway i mean you will be on the moon there will be a base station and the, yes. the water will be there and the heat yes the water yes. yes so there is no way if you take a look at the record of the humanity right you can't uh, restrain the stream so to that's speak. right that's right uh, it's only a matter who is in charge of this that's new system. right that's right. It has always been like that. That was exactly the same with the with the uh, you know world ocean between That's the Portuguese right. and the Spaniards, uh, you yeah. know. And right. Uh, right. we are I think we are just at dawn of the new era in that respect. We are. We are. Uh, Absolutely. And, and thanks to, to the likes like Musk and uh, Bezos and yep. others. And my question is, do that do Chinese have the new space uh, you know uh, giants as well? Right. Right. Well, so the Chinese are a little bit different because they have the state owned enterprises, which, you know, are not as efficient. But the, the thing with and I talked about this in the book, the thing about our high tech R&D, when we developed the telecommunications revolution, when we developed the Internet, when we developed the initial, uh, you know, silicon based computing revolution after World War II, uh, the United States had a very robust federal research and development program. People remember Bell Labs, for instance. And without that robust, unquestioning support for, uh, in US tax dollars uh, to invest in the initial infrastructure of high tech, it's likely that we would have never had Amazon or never had the personal computing revolution, never had, you know, sort of the things that we now take for granted today that that my libertarian friends always say is, is an example of raw free market. I always have to tell them it was actually, as Elizabeth Mazzucato talks about in her book, The Entrepreneurial State, it was actually a, an example of when uh, Keynes met Adam Smith because it required the U.S. federal government to lay the infrastructure initially that said to the venture capital community, okay, the risk has been lowered. There's now the incentive for us to invest in these new budding industries. And then we're going to bring our talent, our private sector talent, and we're going to innovate the heck out of um, out of the this, this new high-tech R&D space. And that's how you had all the technological revolutions of the last 30 and 40 years. My concern is that we no longer really do that here. Uh, the federal R&D budget has declined precipitously since the 90s at precisely the moment that China has been throwing you know, gobs of money at their own research and development se se uh, system. That's why China is now home to a large and advanced quantum computing center in Anhui. That's why China is able to, I mean, my wife was at Yale doing her PhD in genetics. And when she was doing her PhD, she, she told me she and all of her cohort were getting inundated with emails and calls from representatives of Chinese-based genetics and biotech companies. Come over to China, drop what you're doing, we'll pay off your student loans, we'll, we'll, we'll pay you great money as long as you start a genetics lab in China as opposed to America. And that's happening with investors, that's happening all over. And so China might not have the big names like a SpaceX, and thank God they don't, but they do have the ability to build out the infrastructure that would, the advanced infrastructure that would woo um, Western innovators, Western investors to throw their talent there and develop in China as opposed to the United States. And that's what concerns me with the Chinese model is if you build it, they will come as the movie once said. And we used to understand that here in the United States, but in China, they seem to have learned better uh, that, that axiom and they're applying it, I think with greater rigor. 
If you look at the, the development of semiconductors, for instance, we used to create our own semiconductor chips here, no problem. We have since outsourced it almost entirely. And now we have it where, you know, China is probably going to be getting their own indigenous capability very soon. We saw what happened when we basically let the Chinese take the lead on 5G. This is this is what, what I worry about, is that China takes the first step, they get first mover advantage, and then all the investors who normally would go to the West end up going to China because it's easier and the risk has been reduced. That's my fear with, with space. Yeah, just could you elaborate more, expand? The, yeah. Where might the Chinese space program have the edge and where do they focus their efforts? I heard, I you know, it, the moon, yeah, the, the, right. uh, the mining, right. uh, also solar energy. But if you could right. expand more, yeah, about well, it, it might be so, very interesting for the audience. Yes. So the Chinese have what we in the trade would call an integrated strategy that they have married, I think, quite effectively. Uh, and, I, and I hope that they fail for the sake of my country. Um, uh, they have married, I think, quite effectively ends ways means. And so they have identified in China that in order, and I'll just give you the example of mining. So, so they've identified in China, for instance, that in order for China to be prosperous and therefore for the Chinese Communist Party to remain in power, they have to keep uh, and steady flow of resources coming into China that would enhance their living standards. That's why China has been so obsessed with trying to dominate the rare earth mineral market in the, on the planet earth since 2010. Well, now we know that there are rare earth minerals on the moon, for instance. And this is why China has been so keenly interested in mapping out the moon and they have their rover on the moon taking soil samples. It's not for scientific study. They don't care about the science. That's an ancillary concern. It's because they want to determine the, 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 the depth and abundance of these rare earth minerals. And then they will have their uh, lunar base set up there and they're going to dominate the most valuable re uh, re real estate and they're going to mine the heck out of it. And then they're going to send those rare earth minerals mined back to earth and they're going to sell it. And they're going to create an entirely new market based on space-based minerals. And they're going to have all the choke points. We see this also uh, with they're competing. They're competing right now in the launch industry, which of course is SpaceX has the dominant in that one, but the Chinese and the Indians both have developed very low cost efficient ways for getting many countries to have their satellites, their smaller satellites, their CubeSats, which are the next wave of satellite development. Uh, they've developed uh, very low cost ways for launching hundreds of satellites at a time on a single rocket. India was the one, they still hold the record, but when India did that, China said, uh-oh, we better start investing in our own capability here. And now China's developed developing a system to rival India and SpaceX's reusable rocket launch uh, system. So even when they're behind, they're still trying to innovate because if they can fill the gaps and stay competitive with the Americans, uh, they can eventually leapfrog us because they believe in China that they can throw more tax dollars and create greater level of infrastructure, more depth uh, that would allow for the capabilities to be developed and innovated in China as opposed to elsewhere. And space mining is a great example example. China has invested heavily in space-based solar energy. So my colleague, Dr. James Rice of NASA, formerly of NASA, uh, he, he still conducts these, these conferences for NASA, these international conferences. He told me until five years ago, they would, China would send some scientists and they kind of hang around and go to the different lectures, but no one cared about space-based solar. He said suddenly five years ago, an average of 60 Chinese scientists are coming up to his lectures on space-based solar energy, and they want to know everything about it. They want to know every aspect, because the Chinese, we find out, are building a, a solar energy uh, innovation center in China, and uh, they are invested heavily specifically in space-based solar. The reason is because space-based solar would allow them to basically put a collector in geosynchronous orbit, have it exposed to 24 hours sunlight. They would beam back that energy in the form of microwave radiation to the earth. Uh, collectors on the earth would collect the energy. That would cut down on the intermittency problem that terrestrial-based solar power uh, experiences. That would allow them to have low cost alternative energy that's entirely 
entirely independent of any ability for the Americans to cut off that supply unless we blew up their satellite, which obviously would be a cascade of war then. And, and I think the, the objective right now is to avoid war on our part. Um, and so we might be a little disinclined to do that. But the Chinese are heavily invested in space-based solar. This is something that the Americans in 2007, the National Security Council identified space-based solar as a critical strategic uh, uh, technology. We never developed it. We still haven't really developed it. Um, but, so, but, people, but people say that the US uh, Space Force or Air, Air Force yeah. using the space uh, plane can transform the solar energy yes. into the microwave beams for the military purpose. Yeah. Yes, but the, the issue is scalability now. Um, you know, that's that's the issue is is and, and I'm I'm rooting for 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 our people to to innovate it better. Um, but right now China has an all of government, all of society approach. Whereas we have a very specialized kind of small approach, and that that's what worries me is is I, I I'm a big fan of the a la carte approach, and uh, we don't we seem to be a little bit more risk averse uh, than that. I I had a you know I had a, a military officer tell me, look, we can do almost anything in space. The problem is the political will. Our politicians do not give us the order to do much in space, and you know my thought on that was. You can do that for a little bit. You can kick the can down the road for a little bit, but eventually someone else is going to catch up with you and take the can away entirely. And that's what I'm worried that China in particular is trying to do. And we know they've, they've been interested in this. Uh, 1878, one of the most influential essays for Mao was written by a man named Zhang Zhidong. And it was in, in, in English, it was called Exhortation to Study. And at the time, China was being overrun by the European colony, uh, by the European colonial empires. And China was very much uh, in a reduced state. This is a country that's used to being the dominant power and for a very long time was. And Zhang Zhidong advised the young people of China in 1878 in this essay. He said, look, the, 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 Ameri the, the Westerners have figured out technology. That's their edge. So you young people need to go abroad and study at their feet, learn at their schools, and come back to China and impart that knowledge uh, in, indigenously. Give it to us so that we can build a base here, keep up with the Westerners, and eventually leapfrog them. This is something, this is a key thing that Mao glommed on to. Uh, when he rose to power and beat Chiang Kai-shek, the Chinese nationalists, uh, he made a speech upon his victory in which he uh, he called for his, his uh, followers to uh, keep up with Great Brit Britain and beat the Americans. And so even back then, and Michael Pillsbury talks about this a little bit in his book, The Hundred Year Marathon, even back then there was sort of this understanding among China's elite that they need to compete with and leapfrog the Americans in order to ensure that the, the, the world is a Chinese dominated one uh, and not an American one. At the time, of course, people laughed when Mao said that, but look where China is now. And I worry about, and especially with space, I worry about where they're going tomorrow. Yeah, I, I will ask you the, the question about coming war, but uh, yeah. let, let me proceed this question with the following observation. You know, as, as I'm coming from Poland, uh, the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the chapter about Israel, uh, Israel in space, small country, big dreams, yeah. um, uh, uh, interested me a lot by, yeah. by, by showing that uh, having access to space and taking part in this exploration, having assets, yeah. uh, Nanosatellites that you mentioned, you know, yeah. capabilities, uh, communication mm -hmm. revolution, yeah. uh, even military applications, give multiplying uh, sort of factor yeah. even to your military efforts to everything. Absolutely. Okay, and uh, space is a big equalizer. Yep. Of course, as long as there is one arbiter, okay, because if it's not, we have a chaos and war. But uh, uh, so far, let's hope that the United States will control the space. Yes, and and uh, that takes me to, to the following question, as we will be close, you know, sailing towards the end uh, of uh, our conversation. So, what is your gut feeling? We have discussed now. We have analyzed. We you know we shared with right. uh, with the audience our thoughts. Let's let's talk right now about our predictions. Okay, about sure. our gut feelings. Uh, the world in two thousand thirty. Yeah, has there been a war between the great powers? And what and what what about yeah. space? What do we have in space? What's going on in space in yeah, ten years' time? I, I, in ten years' time, and and it really is contingent. I believe I, I do believe it is contingent on the election here. Um, but 
in 10 years time, I think the trends are, especially with China and Russia, their backs are up against the wall where they have to do or die, or at least that's what their leaders think. And so, and this is very similar to the, the thinking of the Japanese mm -hmm. leaders on the eve of the second world war. And so I really think that if we haven't had a war, we are inching very close to one. Um, I think that it's a question of when not if. I think that probably, yes, there will have been some kind of exchange, a military conflict uh, between us and one or all of the other great powers of China and Russia in this case. Um, and so th that is my concern. And I think the first shots will be fired in space. Um, you could make the argument that the first shot was fired when China refused to tell the world about um, the coronavirus, but I think explicitly militarily, uh, the first shots will be fired in space and you're, you're going to see um, a very, very scary time. I think if we can get through this decade without a war, I think that the technology and the military on our side will have caught up and secured space enough that our enemies no longer view that as a vulnerability to exploit, which is why I said in the book would be probably in the 2020s, in this case, 2022, but it could take place at, at any period in the 2020s. That's when the war would likely happen. And I think it will probably happen because we have not invested enough in Space Force uh, to, to remove that capability. Um, and so I, I do think that the chance is very high that this decade we see a conflict of some kind and it will result, I think, in the destruction of our space assets. I cannot agree more, actually. And the people that follow strategy in future know for many years uh, in retrospect that uh, we have uh, been dealing with those issues, sort of trying to prepare the audience at right. the, the end of the history had not really occurred. <laughs> That's right. And the history is right now ready to give us a, a, yes. a, a blow, a sort yes. of a punch in the face. And the question is how well we are boxing, you know, how, how yeah. uh, trained we are and will right. we control. So this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is it. Thank you very much for the conversation. Thank you. Our guest was uh, Brandon uh, Weikert uh, and his book, Winning Space is uh, really a masterpiece that I highly recommend thank to you. everybody. Thank you. Uh, that was Strategy in Future, Jacek Bartosiak. Thank you. Stay, stay with us uh, in the future. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.